And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth have come by Jesus Christ. My friends, I've been asked to respond to a work by Oliver Crisp on the incarnation, the enfleshment of the omnipotent God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the word or logos, and his becoming flesh. This is a remarkable narrative. In Crisp's view, and also in mine, it is the central tenet of Christianity. The person of Jesus of Nazareth, as depicted in the prologue to the Gospel of John, and statements scattered throughout the Pauline epistles, such as the Kenosis hymn in Philippians 2, Colossians 1, and of course, statements found throughout the epistle to the Hebrews, make it very clear that Jesus of Nazareth is God, and yet at the same time, fully human. This reality was ultimately explicated in the earliest councils and creeds of the church, the most famous of these, of course, being the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, and of course culminating in the Council of Chalcedon, which we find about 450 AD. In his work, Oliver Crisp proceeds to explain the powerful and foundational role these examples of creedal orthodoxy, as he puts it, laid for our theological development, while at the same time acknowledging how at the dawn of the 20th century, and perhaps even the late 19th century, there were several assaults on the gift of creedal orthodoxy. And an overemphasis through historicism, postmodernism, and other movements to overemphasize the humanity of Jesus to the neglect or abandonment of his divinity. However, as Crisp notes, there has been a resurgence of what he calls constructive creedal orthodoxy, wherein new philosophical and scientific movements are taken into account as we build upon the foundations in continuity rather than rupture with creedal orthodoxy, with what the Holy Spirit has revealed. I wish I had more time to explain some of this, but uh, the Holy Spirit, as Crisp aptly notes, inspired the early councils of the church to better explain what was contained and is contained in Scripture, while political movements and disputes beginning with figures such as the heretic Arius, Apollinarius, and Nestorius did lead to the establishment of these creeds through the defense of figures such as Athanasius, Nicholas of Myra, etc. At the same time, we know that the Holy Spirit is working through the church, not merely in the past, but also to in the present and in the future. And as such, the content of the creeds, while we can examine them in light of Scripture, clearly explain what was already evident in the word, but needed further explanation. So one question, I have to respond with a question to this work by Crisp. On a pastoral level, how would I, for example, fully defend the divinity of Jesus and explain the divinity of Jesus while expressing the creedal orthodox, understanding that Jesus is also fully human at the same time. How do we take these terms, such as the hypostatic union, the perfect union of Christ's human and divine natures, technical terms uh, that refer, of course, to his enfleshment? How do I take the content of often these very sophisticated points of debate and discussion and make it practical and relevant to the person in the pew. And I would fundamentally argue a secondary question is here. 50% more, actually, of the population 
or female or women. When we say that God became fully human in several translations, but became specifically a male, became man, uh, what of the relationship of female parishioners, female believers in Christ to this incarnate God in a male context? And I would argue my answer to the first part of my question, how do we make this relevant, the humanity and divinity of Jesus, is to explain pastorally the fact that Jesus of Nazareth affirms time and time again in his human nature the beauty and the reality of our human experience. The first thing that Jesus does when he's raised from the dead is he shares a meal with his apostles. Jesus weeps at the tomb of Lazarus. We see Jesus being righteously and indignantly angry at injustice. Uh, in the sense, he is the, the real social justice warrior in that sense. We see Jesus authentically uh, moved to awe at the faith of the centurion. We see the range of human emotions which are good in the person of Jesus. While at the same time, seeing the reality of Jesus' divinity, the fact that Christ demonstrates power to forgive sin that we cannot do. That Christ demonstrates the power over disease and illness in a unique way. That, of course, in our own human nature, while we have great scientific advancements and while we don't deny the aspect of the movement of the Holy Spirit in us as believers, is unique to Christ. We see attributes of divinity also plain there, and that is good because we are not fully divine as Christ is in his pre-existence and his pure divine nature. We realize our necessity, our need for him as our personal savior, our need to rely on he who can pay for all sins. He goes to the cross where we cannot while at the same time embracing the full humanity of Jesus, following in, him, in his footsteps in so much as we take up our own crosses, our own sufferings, and redemptively unite them to the offering of Christ. This can be done, but it means balancing both the divinity and humanity of Jesus. And that is certainly something which always is a pastoral difficulty when preaching from the Gospels. It is a beautiful gift, but it's complicated. The secondary element, what about the 50% or more of the population being women? How do we address a, uh, a woman's experience of discussing the incarnation, making the man Jesus relevant to both women and men? And this is where perhaps I am speaking uh, much from my Roman Catholic background here, but where the connection between Christology and Mariology is incredibly important. Jesus does not become man. The second person of the Trinity does not become man as a result of a cosmic flash of light or ex nihilo out of nothing. Instead, it is through the yes of a particular woman in the fullness of human history. A woman in a society which is admittedly patriarchal, where she has limited prospects socially and where she is culturally in a situation where she is threatened with potential stoning uh, by becoming pregnant before the fulfillment of her kutub and, and matrimony. What this means in practical terms is the heroism of Mary, her cultural and human understanding, um, is essential to the enfleshment of Jesus and is connected to his story. We cannot separate Mary's story from Jesus' story. And therefore, when we discuss these things, while we don't necessarily need to adopt all the principles of the medieval church or even uh, the development of Mariology within Orthodoxy or Catholicism to appreciate this, the one element that um, any hearer 
any viewer of Scripture should understand, is the fact that Mary and her story is part and parcel with the enfleshment of Jesus. And while I'm not going to sit here and try to explain uh, the ways in which we can balance our reading of these twin stories and the areas where there could be excess, for example, uh, or uh, over diminishment, I would argue that perhaps we need to emphasize her story and Christ's unique relationship to women as a result of his enfleshment in order to ensure that we see the fullness of the humanity of Jesus, which he acquired through Mary in a relevant and applicable way. So I hope that this has been helpful and I look forward to continuing to explore these articles and these works of theology with you.